Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, and welcome to day nine of Dezine 15, a digital festival celebrating Dezine's 15th birthday. For this, we asked 15 creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world for the better over the next 15 years. Each day, one of them will be presenting their manifesto for a better world. Today, we're speaking to designer Jalila Esaidi about her proposal. Hi, Jalila. Hi, Marcus. How are you and where are you? Where are you speaking to us from today? I'm speaking from Eindhoven in the Netherlands um, in BioArt Laboratories uh, in the BioArt Forest. Ah, you told me about this. You're it's in a place in the forest where you tell us what you do in the, in the BioArt Forest place. Yeah, so I run BioArt Laboratories here and uh, we are in uh, old German bunkers and uh, running uh, facilities like labs to um, help international talents to create their BioArt works uh, yeah, to better the world. Uh, we are all focused the coming five years on uh, creating the symbiocene and uh, finding solutions uh, to uh, solve world problems. Okay, so pretty ambitious then. Yes. What is this? What is the symbiocene? So, um, yeah, we all know we live in the Anthropocene, and in the symbiocene, we are more uh, moving to a more symbiotic relationship with, uh, yeah, all other organisms and life forms uh, who are with us uh, on this uh, planet Earth. And this isn't your only job. If you look at your CV, you do a, a few things. Tell us about some of the other things you do. Yeah, so I'm an artist and entrepreneur, and uh, one of my previous projects was creating a bulletproof human skin uh, with genetically modified spider silk or a mastic transforming cow manure into new raw materials, for example, the textile industry and yeah, several other projects like that. And I remember we did a talk together in Eindhoven a few years back, and I never forget the, the thing you said about that we need more science fiction. We need more designers who are thinking of big visions for the future, not small little tiny changes, but things that could scale up to yes. be world changing, right? Yes, because as a humankind, we are we are quite arrogant. We are just a little speck in the total of, of, of the total. And I think um, we have so much to learn and, and to discover and uh, to apply to our technology to find that ultimate um, inventiveness that nature already uh, offers. And, um, and also, I don't know if you know this, but that, that statement that you made was also part of the inspiration behind this festival, where okay. we thought, let's give people the idea to think, uh, the opportunity to think big. So thank you very much for that. And then, of course, it made sense to invite you to be part of this, um, this project. But tell us about your background then. Did you study in Eindhoven at the design school? No, I, I studied, uh, first I was an uh, entrepreneur, I had a little tattoo shop, so I was focused on, on creating tattoos because I was in love with, with skin, it tells so much uh, about a person and where he's from, and um, then I studied art and then arts education, and um, during my projects I also uh, became uh, focused on social entrepreneurship, um, and at the moment, um, yeah, running bio arts and, and my company Inspider uh, to bring solution also to the markets. Okay, now you've written a pretty radical manifesto. I think it's definitely the most radical one so far. Uh, it kind of turns conventional thinking upside down, which is great. Do you want to share your screen now and tell us all about your idea? Yes, I'm going to do that. Okay, can I start, Marcus? Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I should have said, <laughs> okay. yes, we can see that. <laughs> okay. Consumerism, materialism, and waste. A bizarre disruption of ecological thinking has seized our thought process. The ecological vision of apocalypse, a vision fueled by current environmental threats that have dominated recent news headlines. Since the beginning of the 60s, eco-communities predicted a new phase for this planet. 
transitioning people from an era of abundance to one of scarcity. The most radical thinkers among them advocate for a no growth society, depopulation and de-development, warning us to make voluntary adjustments now in order to avoid making involuntary changes later. This apocalyptic distortion of ecology treats nature in an unnatural way. As a nurturing mother, a protector of the Garden of Eden, a garden which our consumerism, materialism and waste has destroyed. A garden which she will bring back if only we get rid of our pollutants and waste. Driven by nostalgia or the emotional distress caused by environmental change, this form of thinking might make sense. But if you look at the bigger picture, this idea cannot be further from the truth. Nothing is more indifferent to the sanctity of its environment than nature, especially life. It is the essence of life to consume and produce waste. Over billions of years, countless amounts of bacterial trash producers and litter, litter, litter scatterers with their environmental indifference and reckless irresponsibility have soiled this once pristine landscape. This soil, this layer of garbage, this trash coat of ever increasing complexity is what gives this planet its very name, Earth. Life has littered this place with hundreds of meters of its tubes, shells, layers, and its innumerable pollutants and poisons. A trash coat that we are not recognizing for what it is. A trash coat that often ironically represents the pureness of nature like the pristine white cliffs of Dover, which in reality are a hundred meter tall natural garbage pile made out of the remains of tiny algae. Yet, one's trash or poison might be another's paradise, like what happened with the deadly byproducts of an ancient cyanobacteria, oxygen. Driven by an inventiveness, that pills anything humans have ever accomplished, it's nature that turns these poisons into pistons of exotic engines that should never have been. Through this inventiveness, this outrageous irresponsible trash of the first generations turns into the treasure of which a second generation thrives. You would think, in light of this all, that combining self-aware life with this inventiveness would act as a catalyst. Yet it is clear in our design approaches that we are still lacking the understanding of this resource. We are designing products with increased longevity, processes that are less polluting, products which are repairable, products that are reusable, processes that are recyclable, and products that use less packaging. All of these sustainable design strategies might seem to make sense in our current system, yet, they merely pass on the problem to the next generation. Accomplishing nothing more than postponing the inevitable, the total assimilation of the anthropophonic effects, processes, objects, and materials by nature. The only way to achieve this assimilation while humankind is still around is to tap into the unknown potential of this resource called inventiveness much like the black box of artificial neural networks, which is ruled by the presence of chaos with high degrees of freedom. We are starting to grasp that inventiveness is not purely driven by logic and reason, but also by a factor that cannot be interpreted. To incorporate this knowledge into design, we need a total different mindset and a new design approach. We should design for the maximal probability of nature doing something outrageous. And nature is already misbehaving, producing fungi that decomposes radioactive materials and bacteria that can eat plastics. This mindset should no, not have to offer any direct solutions. However, it should set the stage for an increased probability of nature interacting in novel ways, accelerating nature through design. Just like how in the biomedical field, material surface topographies are optimized for cell adhesion using evolutionary algorithms. We should design to optimally allow chaos to form potential symbiotic relationships with our trash. 
design not only with the human end user in mind, but design that is mutually dependent on and benefits the health of all ecosystems. Design through which consumerism, materialism, and waste equip nature with the diversity of trust it needs to work its magic faster. And to give rise to the new era of the symbiocene. Thank you. Do you want to unshare your screen now? Yes. Powerful stuff. And um, I don't think I've ever heard anyone refer to the White Cliffs as Dover, of Dover as a 100 metre pile of trash. <laughs> before. But it is. <laughs> that wasn't in your manifesto. You must have thought of that at the last minute as a nice provocation. So, so are you suggesting that, first of all, it seems like you're suggesting that this whole movement to try and remove waste, eliminate waste streams is misguided because you're almost saying that waste streams are a feedstock for the planet in a way, just a slightly different feedstock from what it's been used to for the last few million years. Well, I'm not saying that it's misguided, but um, if we look at it from a bigger perspective um, and look at nature, it, it's already doing that. And um, if it's not happening now, I think in a hundred million years, nature will solve all those problems but um, if we still want to be in that red race as a humankind uh, we have to take these little steps and uh, um, try to deal with these problems and try to find little solutions but uh, in a way I'm saying yeah nature nature is already doing it and, and can solve this with us, us. <laughs> yeah with the sort of that but it might take 100 million years which is sort of in, in in nature's time frame that's a blink of an eye but in human time frame that's quite a long time to wait but but so are you what are you saying that designers should do then that they should abandon attempts to be sustainable they should abandon attempts to be circular and carry on polluting no, I, I think they should make use of, of this natural, uh, of nature's inventiveness. For example, um, we are producing these bottles in mass, but think about the option of producing these millions of bottles and every bottle individual with a, a different use of material and um, that we tag them and that uh, when a person finds the perfect uh, surface that is in, 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 in symbiosis uh, and breaking down, that we should research that further to come to that perfect solution um, um, yeah, that nature is going to offer us through its inventiveness. And that's not only driven by logic and reason, but it's also um, in, in the serendipity, in the intuition of nature and um, yeah, we still have to discover a lot about that. And I think designers should help uh, nature a bit by uh, thinking yeah, in, in a way, not in mass producing, but in um, um, mass evolutionary research and, and adding that uh, yeah, to the table. You used this word near the beginning of your manifesto, um, solastalgia. Can you yeah. explain to us what that means? Yeah, so, so solastalgia is a, a word invented by a philosopher, Glenn Elbrecht. And solastalgia is um, a bit similar to nostalgia. Um, it's a feeling of, of um, missing um, that environmental uh, biodiversity we are used to because we are so close in, in buildings and, and since the industrial um growth um yeah we are further away from nature than, than ever and and are you saying that that's something we need to get over that feeling of solastalgia that it we it's almost like a a pining for a perfect nature of of the past what are you suggesting that we need to somehow replace that with a acceptance that things change or what is it no, no, we should stimulate uh, biodiversity because the solution is in nature, in the biodiversity. We need to offer nature as much uh, materials, other living organisms as possible to tap into that um, yeah, inventiveness uh, of nature. But does that include um, toxic um, materials that nature might take a very long time to figure out what to do with? You gave the example of how certain biological reactions produced oxygen so it was something toxic became something vital but 
is there a limit to the kind of poison that we can chuck at nature and expect <laughs> it to deal with it? Well, Marcus, I don't have any answers on that because um, that's why I'm focusing the coming five years with BioArt Laboratories on the Symbiocene to find those solutions. What is it that we need to offer nature and what have, do we have to do um, yeah, in order to, to feed that intuition, to, to make that inventiveness happen, to create that world of Symbiocene where we all uh, yeah, try to survive together? That's a good point, because we didn't expect you to come up with a manifesto that was fully thought through <laughs> and you had an answer to every question. I'm just I'm just I'm just intrigued by some of the ideas that you're having. But you're absolutely right. We don't know. This is an idea for 15 years or 100 million years, as as you said. But let's change the topic a little bit then. So what do you think about what's going on now in Glasgow with the COP26 climate conference? Do you think that that's like a is that something that gives you hope? Is it irrelevant? Are they are they full of blah blah blah? What's what's your take on the way that we're dealing with the climate climate crisis? Yeah, like I said, nature will survive, but if we want to survive as as a human uh, kind, I see it again as a bottle, and and what is happening there is is solving half of the bottle and half of the bottle is, is moving to the next generation. So it's not a total solution, but it's, it's part of the solution to keep humankind alive. Tell us some more about some of the, the projects you're working on then. Okay, so this, the whole idea of the symbiosine is something you've just, it's, it's a future project, you haven't solved it yet, but do you have any areas of research that are promising? Yeah, and I'm not going to solve it. it it's not a pro the, the, um, this problem is not for the individual. We are going to solve it all together or not. Um, I think it's it's the complexity um, that we need to figure out or to tap into. Um, yeah, and, and my biggest project at the moment is still BioArt Laboratories, uh, working together with all these uh, young promising talents from all over the world um, to see what kind of solution ideas they have to, uh, yeah, to, to stimulate this uh, inventiveness to come up with solutions um, that maybe do not fit with the capitalistic system we are living in now. But I'm believing that we are at uh, a cross point um, that, that systems are going to tip and change. At least I'm hoping on, on that. <laughs> yeah. And a few years ago, you, we worked, you worked on this celebrated project that took farm shit, let's be honest about it, <laughs> and turned it into a valuable resource for making textiles out of. I mean, is is was that a provocation or was that a, a real business opportunity? And how is it going? Well, that's a real business. Um, it's it's patented technology, and um, at the end, uh, mastic will be applied uh, to create circular closed system in every country with intensive farming. Uh, but mastic is also a short-term solution uh, to serve us as to serve us as as humankind. It's not going to be the solution uh, that benefits uh, all organisms and and, and nature in, in this part. And um, yeah, so yeah, mastic is, is still going on, um, and we are now in the phase before we are going to scale up and and produce uh, a lot of uh, cellulose uh, pulp for the textile industry. And that can't happen soon enough, as far as I'm concerned, because I don't know if you heard, but in, in my country, in the UK, there's a huge problem with um, waste from farms just going into rivers and, and killing everything. And it seems extraordinary that this, this, this shit seems to have no perceived value, that it's considered a, a waste stream that should be just like... Yeah, but that's the problem, Marcus. We, we have to... I, I think we should eliminate the word waste, because... There is no, of course, um, we are part of nature and it, it is waste, but um, we have to give value, new values to, to waste because it's, it's, it's gold. It's, it's a product uh, which we can use as humankind. And um, because of our capitalistic systems, our, our politics, uh, farms grow and, and start intensive farming and if i look at the netherlands uh, we are trying to downscale uh, intensive farming here in the netherlands um but it's every time very short time um thinking uh from the political perspective so every four years we have new leaders and they decide on, on do we need to scale up do we need to scale down and now we have uh, those climate goals uh, we have to achieve together 
But in a way, nature is not looking um, on that with that logic and reason we are doing as a humankind. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's very important um, um, that we learn from the inventiveness of nature and think long, long term and not every time in, in those boxes and in the short term ideas of solution. Of course, they help for the short term, but the real solutions are, are in the future. And yesterday I was talking to a guy who was cutting down some trees in someone's garden. And then he was using a big machine to turn the branches into little chips of wood. And then he was putting them in his truck and he had a truck full of these wood chips. I mean, it must have been, I don't know, 10 tons or something like that. And I asked him what he was going to do with the chips. And he said that he has to, he drives them to this place in the countryside. And then he gives the chips to this other company and he doesn't get paid anything for them, which seemed extraordinary, like tons of biomaterial that he just has to give to someone else. I don't know what they did with them, maybe fuel or maybe for people's gardens or something like that. But it seems an incredible waste of an amazing resource. Yeah, it's the same with the manure here in the Netherlands. Farmers are getting paid eight euro per, per ton and um, the manure is driven free to them. So. I, I remember in the beginning when I started with Mastic, every investor thought about that. So you get eight euro per ton and the material is brought to you by free. Yeah, that's, that's a huge opportunity to make a lot of money. But if you think about the total circle, if you really want to solve a problem, um, it's not only about the impact economically, it's the impact on, on every area. And um, it's not going to be... The solution, yeah, of course, for the investors and the money, but not for us as a humankind. So what other things, tell us some other things that you're working on then. You, you said that you're, you're an entrepreneur. So do you have any other business ventures that, that are addressing these problems? No, that no, you can must... tell us about? <laughs> no, I, I wish, Marcus. Of course, there are a lot of ideas, but there is so much time in a day or in a week. So my main focus is now bio art laboratories uh, working on the solutions for the future and 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 rolling out mastic uh, it's not easy uh, because yeah you have to deal with politics you have to deal with regulation um, for big companies and and it's also difficult because the investments uh, like the textile industry already did uh, mostly in countries um, like india or china yeah, are fixed for the, the 10 years and um uh, in the Netherlands, we don't have a textile industry because we shipped it all out to countries with, with low uh, incomes because the labor is cheap. So um, it's quite difficult to, to get that circle complete. Uh, but also our educational systems uh, in the Netherlands, we don't have uh, a lot of people who still have the old knowledge of, of working uh, with uh, craftsmanship, for example. So... It's, it, we have cracks in, in all the systems. And I think the solution is, is to yeah, solve those cracks and, and create that whole circle again so that you can focus more on, on local solutions. Uh, but that's, that's from um, uh, my entrepreneurial <laughs> perspective, because if I go back to, to uh, the manifesto, it's, it's no solution, it's the short-term solution. And, and we have to go further to find the real solutions uh, for the future. And finally, you, you made a comment in your manifesto about accelerating nature yeah. through design. So tell us a bit more about what you mean by that. Yeah, I, I tried to explain it. But for example, this, this bottle, um, if we look at, at, at our companies, they are making millions of those bottles. And an idea could be that they make millions of uh, bottles with different surfaces and that you tag them and um, that you um, make a prize of, out of it, that the person who finds the bottle, who is decom decomposing the best, uh, wins a prize. And then uh, with that knowledge, you can again make a million different bottles and yeah, still keep feeding uh, that inventiveness of nature um, in, in breaking down, for example, this plastic to find yeah, the right solution um, and in that way yeah, feeding um, nature materials to experiment with and to get smarter. 
So I guess that's what you mean by the symbiosis that we're working in partnership with nature, yes. but instead of everything remaining the same forever to appease our nostalgia, we're accepting that that develops a new type of nature. So the relationship is changing all the time. Something yes, like that. Yes, because we are we are sticking now too much to the status quo. Like if, if a company decides I'm going to make these, these bottles of bioplastic, they are a million bottles of the same bioplastic, but we are knowing that it's, still not functional, uh, 100% optimal. So um, there is still a lot of research and experimentation and tapping also in its intuition, in that, in that area we don't know. Um, tr trail and error for, yeah, it, the trail and error that nature already has had um, billions and billions of, near, of, of, of years. Well, brilliant. It's brilliant to speak to you as usual, Jalila. Thank you so much for, yeah, for your provocation. You. And good luck with all your work. And um, I good hope work. it doesn't take 100 million years, that's for sure. <laughs> 15 maybe is a bit short, but somewhere closer to that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much.